So the title of today's sermon is Family Matters. And it's a broad topic, but it's who you, there we go, awesome. Thank you. He just goes back there and it just starts working. Isn't that great? That is wonderful. Family matters, and here's why. Because remember how we were talking about just a couple of weeks ago and multiple times here in the church about how the Israelites had light in their house, but the Egyptians, it was dark, super dark in the plague. But the light, and we're, so if we're living now in a version of that time when the world is dark and there's death and destruction everywhere, but in our house, we have light that's in our house from the inside out. Not a light that can be manufactured, but a light from the inside out. He wants, I think it's easy to see that the devil is attacking families. Divorce rates are up, children runaways are up, things that are happening to your kids are up, but it doesn't have to be with us. And um, this isn't just a message about kids. What this message is about is who we are and what we can do about it. Because it is not just going along, doing our thing, and it doesn't matter what we say. It doesn't matter what we do. It doesn't matter how we pray. It very much matters, all of those things. And when we get hooked into that and we get plugged into that power source, that's when effectual change can happen. And also when we believe it can happen. And you know what? It's interesting because last week's message that Pastor Mary taught about don't lose hope, one of the things that she said in there that I appreciated, and I especially appreciated this week, is when things happen to you, we are assured troubles, trials, sufferings. Those things happen because we live here. God does not necessarily bring them, but he can use them once they're here. One of the things she said that stuck with me is just because you are in a trial does not mean that you messed up. And I wanted to repeat that because I came from a church that said, if you were sick, it had to be something that was wrong with you. Julian would have not just been on the prayer team for being sick and for healing. He would have been on, well, there must be some sin in his life that he got sick. That's not true. We live in a fallen world and sometimes things come on you and things come around you, but it's how you walk through them and that he is going to walk through them with you. Julian was never alone one second while he was sick, whether he felt like God was there or not. He had the assurance, though, that he said, I am with you. You will get through this. You are enough because I'm in you. You can do it. And that is the tenacity of this generation that we all need to catch. And it's been this specific generation of young people we need to pray for. We need to latch on to. We need to bring them up alongside of us because they are very, very important. And I was talking about in Isaiah with the Israelites, but now it talks about here that in the last days, the darkness shall cover the earth, deep darkness the people, but the Lord will arise over you and his glory will be seen upon you. That tells you that you do not have to be like the world. In the world, not of the world. You do not have to have all the problems that the world has. You don't have to stand for it. And if those things are coming on to you, you have an assurance of God walking through it with you. And then just like she said last week, we, how you walk through something is different for every person. You may have a hangnail that puts you in bed for a week. But a hangnail is not going to even make the prayer list for most people. It's perspective. It's also maturity and how mature you are. I've been through some stuff. At my age, I've been through a couple of things. But I've been through them. And I know that it doesn't matter anymore. Those things are no longer a problem because when I see those things happening, I'm like, devil, please. I've been through this. I know the word on this. I know that Jesus saves. I know that we are constantly cared for. And that doesn't even bother me. I see what you're trying to do. No. You have that assurance because not only do you have the written word, but now you have the word that's been working in your life and you know. Like when Julian's sick next time, I'm sorry to keep going back to you, buddy, but when Julian's back, sick next time, he'll be like, well, I'm not as sick as what I was and I was fine then, so I know I'll be okay now. How about this? If he chooses to have children when he's younger, when he's older, not younger, when he's older, and then those kids are sick, I've been through this. It may be dark right now, but I've been through this. 
I know that God is a healer. I know that it doesn't matter what today looks like, but the outcome is healing every time. That is what's in him now that may not have been there before. Because you know it's different when you hear it and when you experience it. But once you experience it, there's no stopping you. But I'm here to tell you, we don't just have to lie around and let things happen to us. We don't, and especially with our kids. We are supposed to be the glory in his family, in our families, in the world. It's not normal for us to have dysfunctional families. That should not be our norm. It should, we, our homes should be homes of peace and patience and love and all the fruits of the Spirit and discipline. That's not a fruit of the Spirit, but that's something as parents we're called to do. We're not supposed to let our people, our kids run around like craziness. We have authority in where our feet tread, in our sphere of influence. And we, as soon as we know that, things are going to be a lot easier for us. We have privileges because we're righteous. In Genesis it says, Then the Lord said to Noah, Noah, enter the ark, you and all your household, for you alone I have seen to be righteous. Well, here's the good news, is that Noah was righteous based on works. We are no longer righteous based on works. We're right, righteous based on Jesus. So you, insert your name, you, Kim, you and your household can now enter in to the ark of protection. Why? Because I've seen you to be righteous. So all you got to do is go on the ark, and there is safety in there. We just have to know that we don't have to stay out and be drowned with everybody else. There's an ark, and get in it. God's heart is to save entire families, entire families, and don't lose sight of that. The leader of the house is the man. If the man's not around or what, not there for some reason, it is the woman of the house. Take that stance and take that authority over you and your children, no matter how old you are. If you have grandchildren, if you have people that you are maybe not related directly to, but they're in your sphere of influence, pray over them. Declare what you want to see happen. Nothing, is, nothing bothers me more than for people to talk about how horrible this generation is and leave it. You know what? The kids are the same. We're the ones who changed. The kids are only the kids how they're acting because we're the ones who changed. Not in my house, though. That's not true in my house. My kid is not horrible. My kid is not all the things that are happening outside the world. Because he's perfect? No. Because I'm great? No. Because I know what my rights are as a believer and as his parent. And I don't move from them. I don't care what everybody else is doing. I don't care about the percentage rates. How about this? Take those numbers and use them as a weapon and say, not in Pittsburgh, not in our church, not in my house, not on my street. School shootings do not have to happen in your school. That is not part of the persecution that we are meant to go through. But why do they happen? Because people don't know what their authority is. You take a bloodline and you draw it around your school. And you say, not here, not in my house, not where my kid's foot treads. This will not happen to my child. This will not happen to the people that are around him. And they are saved. They're in the ark because he's in the ark. Because you have that bubble of protection. And I hate to say the word bubble because it seems like weak, but that's how I call it. So that's what I'm going to call it. I have a bubble of protection that is around him. And you better be hoping if something goes down, you're close to him or close to me or close to Nick. But here's the beauty. You have it too, because you're part of this church. Because guess what? When I pray, because I know my authority, and I pray for you, and for you, and for you, and for you, and because we are connected in the Spirit, that extends to you. It matters who you hang around. It matters where you plop down on a Sunday morning. It matters where you lay your head. It matters what you allow into your head. Because guess what? If I put that bubble of protection around you, and I pray that hedge of protection, and then you go out and do what you know God called you not to do, you can walk out of it because you have a free will. When prayers can handle the devil. They can handle demons. But they, they cannot change the free will of another person. However, what happens between your free will and what happens in my sphere 
absolutely there is protection there. Do you understand? It is, we're going to get into it a little bit more. I have, so we, I have a ton of books. This is one that I have. Look at this book. So this is one of my mom's books. And it's called The Believer's Authority by Kenneth E. Hagen. And it's old. It's, this one was printed in the 80s. But it doesn't even have a back cover on it because it's been used so much. But I'm going to read a little bit of this because I like how he worded it. And it says, this is um, Kenneth Hagen, who is, um, he was a Word of Faith guy. And really where our roots came from, where mom's roots came from and Raymond Bible School. So he wrote this book and he says, back in the 1940s, I asked myself the question, do we have authority that we don't know about? That we haven't discovered that we aren't using? I had little glimpses of spiritual authority once in a while. Like others, I stumbled on it and had exercised it without knowing exactly what I was doing. Has that ever happened to anybody else? You're like, oh, something worked and you don't even know how it worked. Maybe just me. So I began to study along this line thinking, hmm, I don't, I am not really sure. Let's, let's dive into this. Let's see. And I began to see more and more light on the situation. As a result of my studies, I concluded that we as a church have authority on the earth that we've never yet even realized. Authority that we're not even using. A few of us have barely gotten to the edge of that authority, but before Jesus comes again, this is for us, pay attention. Before Jesus comes again, there's going to be a whole company of believers who will rise up with the authority that is theirs. They will know what is theirs, and they will do the work that God intended that they should do. That's us if we walk in it. That is absolutely us. We have authority. Jesus told us, even when he was here, that we have authority. We have authority to, to command the blessing over our family and over future generations as well because, of, because they're related to us. In Luke, it says, Then the 70 returned with joy, saying, because the 70 were the disciples that he sent out, and they returned with joy back to Jesus. And they said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said, pardon me, he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. That's powerful. So, We are no longer begging Jesus to do stuff for us. That sounds weird. Because when you pray, you pray to God. But when you know that you have the authority, it's like a police officer. You have the authority to stop demons and Satan's plots against you. When you are a police officer and you're standing there in the traffic area and you are directing traffic this way, traffic this way, traffic this way, and you're standing there, you do not maybe have the power to stop that semi that's there, but you have the authority to stop that semi that's coming at you. Because your hand is up and you say, not here. And why? Because you and the badge are backed by a whole lot of people that if you go past it, now now that semi is in trouble. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm saying that you have authority because you are a Christian. It was given to you day one. Now, our job is to figure out what is ours in Christ. That's why we come to church. It's not just fire insurance that we're not going to go to hell. That absolutely happens. But while we're here, it is to renew our mind to who we are in Christ and what he has paid for for us so that we walk in the authority that he paid a high price for. So when you see something coming your way, we're not going to just stand by and be like, "Hmm, look at it, I hope nothing happens. Oh, Lord, you better do something about that. No, you speak to the thing, whatever your thing is, and you say, semi, you stop in the name of Jesus. Sickness, you leave in the name of Jesus. All the things that are supposed to happen that the devil meant for me today, I bind in the name of Jesus, and I will not allow them to come into my home. It must stop. Or sit around and see what happens. You're going to be just like the world. Going to heaven, but just like the world. It's time that we stop living like the world. We were never meant to live like the world. You're supposed to be lights in the darkness. Not another house with darkness. 
We're not trying to teach anyone to cope with darkness. That's not the idea of the church. That's not the call that's on my life. My, light is to, my, my call on my life is to say, yes, there's darkness. There doesn't have to be darkness in your house. And here's how you tell others that there doesn't have to be darkness in their house either. And that darkness is what you deem to be dark. However far you want to take it. It's however far you want to get into the Bible and find out what is yours. If you believe in healing and that's all you want, then only take that. If you believe in prosperity and that's all you want, then only take that. If you believe that your children are favored of the Lord and that's all you want, then only take that. You can leave it all. It's up to you. Nothing automatically happens in this world. Everything is by choice. Everything is by knowing that you have a choice and then walking out on that choice. Have you ever been in a place, and this is one of the reasons why I love praise and worship, you can sense the tangible presence of God during praise and worship. And if you don't feel it, then come to the front row because it's there. We, when we are praising the Lord corporately, you can get the feeling, your emotions can even get involved, but you can sense that God is right here and hovering. Did you know that that is absolutely corporate, but it can be wherever you go? When you walk into this building, you sense that peace. Whatever happened to you on the way here leaves at the door. It doesn't come in with you unless you drag it in. There's a peace and a dedication to learn about what Jesus did for you here. And that can be taken with you everywhere you go. You've met people like this. You've met people that you just like to be around. Well, why do you think you like to be around them? My guess is they're connected. They're connected to the power source. They're connected to the authority. And that is why you like hanging around them. But guess what? So are you. And it doesn't matter how old you are, whether you are 110, 10, or 2. It's our job, though, as Christians, to make sure that the babies around us, the children in Christ, and the actual physical children know what's available to them. The Bible even says that you train up your children. It says train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from them. That word in there, that you should train up the child in the way that he should go, it comes from a root word meaning the mouth, like meaning to taste. And we know that the Bible also says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Now, when we are raising spiritual kids or our actual kids, or maybe you didn't raise your kids like this, and maybe it's, good, it's time to show them now, you can't give what you don't have. Get the light with you and then give them the taste of it show them that there's a difference when they're in your presence than in their friend's presence in somebody else's presence there is supposed to be a glory that is around you god's manifested presence that is around you at all times and when that is evident it doesn't matter who they are you're gonna be the one that all the babies want to run to be aware of that that the old people come to, that even the dogs come to, because they sense, and I'm sorry, but it's true, they sense that peace that passes all understanding. And there's, what's in them is drawn to what's in you. But it's up to you how you go through life. If you want to go through life all freaked out about every little thing and not knowing who you are, that's your choice. Don't do that, though. There's no reason to do that. We are to be solid and we're to cause other people to want what we have, teach them how to do it, and then go out and be solid pillars in their own community and families. That's what we are called to do. Satan definitely wants our kids, no doubt about it. If you look at even the, the story I was talking about with Pharaoh and the Israelites, Pharaoh is a type of Satan. And he says in there, it talks in here about the next couple of scriptures that he says, okay, guys, y'all can go and have your feast. He's going to release the Israelites. And he said, you can go and have your feast, but you leave your children here. At first he was like, yeah, 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 it's fine. Go ahead. And he's like, no, 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 no. Leave your kids here. And why? He said, well, it doesn't even matter. Like they don't even know what's going on. And sometimes, isn't that how you feel? Especially when you're, if you've been a parent and you have littles, then you're like, do they even know? Like, why am I going through the pain to get them in the outfit, to take them to the church, all this stuff? Why am I doing this? It's because they do know. 
they do know. We need to train them in that because when they are, when you catch them when they're young, then they don't have to have all the baggage that we had. But the beauty of what has happened, the beauty of who God is, is that if you didn't do it, it's not too late to start now. It's not too late to show them and to train them by your example, by the fact that you are the light in the darkness. It is not too late for them to still be drawn to the Jesus that is inside of you. But you don't be, don't be deceived that these little things don't matter because they do matter. Going to church matters. Giving them a taste of goodness matters. Being good to your adult children matters. Being good to your neighbors matter. Those things all matter. And it's what we're called to do. Teach them about Jesus. It says in Deuteronomy, it says, you shall teach them. Now this is talking about, they was just talking about the law. You shall teach them to your children, teach the laws to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. We no longer live under the law, but when you go back to the original Hebrew, the word all of tav is in there, which is the beginning and the end, which is the, the sign of Jesus, but it's not translated in there. But if you go back, those words are actually in there. So now for us, post karas we are to take everything that happens that is good and holy and wonderful that's in our lives, and we're supposed to tell them, this is why. Because it it's very clear. It's when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. It has to be part of every part of your life when you're talking to them. Because otherwise they don't know that the reason why you have food on the table or a roof over your head is because Jesus loves them. But once you ingrain that into them, then it becomes like second nature to them, or more accurately, first nature to them. Because that's who their spirit is, and that's who it wants to connect to. And we're just showing them what's already in front of their faces. But it is up to us to do that. Have, take every opportunity to talk to them about it. Remember when Joshua sent out the spies, the two spies, and he, they went and they checked out Jericho, and they went to Rahab. And Rahab told them everything that was going on and then hid them on the roof, okay? One of the things that was interesting that I hadn't seen, and I heard another preacher preach about it, so it wasn't my exact revelation. I'm going to just give credit where credit is due. But one of the things that happened was she said, Rahab said, For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. So they came out of Egypt 38 years before this. They knew what God had done for them. It's just like they forgot what God had done for them. Don't let that happen to you. She was not even a believer. She, she believed as much as what she knew, but she was not one of God's chosen people. But even she could see with her eyes and hear with her ears the stories of God's goodness. So she knew that when they came, when they came coming, the God that parted the Red Sea was coming with them. And so what did she do? She said, hey, listen, I'm helping you out. Me and my house, I want you to save. And that's exactly what happened. Her and her house, her whole house was saved. Her mom, her kid, all these people were saved because of what, why? Because of what the head of the house did. She took authority and said, I know what's coming. I've done this and now I want you to remember me. And they honored that. Now, one of the, this is interesting. In the same story, it talks about, and the young men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab. This is after they brought out Rahab. This is when they're going to attack her, her mother, her father, her brothers, and all that she had. So that they brought out all her relatives and left them outside of the camp of Israel, and then they attacked. And there is evidence that even to this day, where her house was is still standing, whereas the rest of the walls that they went around had fallen. Now, the young men... That specific word means infancy to 20 years old. When I think I'm going to spit, send in a spy for someplace, I would probably choose somebody who was very wise. I probably wouldn't be like, hey, kid, go tell me what you see. This, that generation of young adolescent to 20 years old is when they're talking about. Those are kids 
who did not see the Red Sea. This was 38 years after. They had to be taught. They had to hear. They had to be taught about the goodness of God and what he had done for them because they didn't see it with their own eyes. But then what happened? Those kids, and I'll say kids, those young men were the ones who were chosen to go in to assess the situation and to give a report. It didn't matter that they weren't 50 years old. It didn't matter that they weren't 70 years old. Even then, God is using that generation to affect his will and his purpose. This is why the devil wants them. They are powerful, and so are we. But they had to be taught. And then look at what they did. They were sure of themselves to the point that they said they knew they had the authority. That when Rahab said, I want me and my household saved, they had the authority to say, okay. I know that if I tell Joshua that you are going to be saved, that the army that's coming to take everybody out will not touch you. And that's exactly what happened. They knew who they were. They knew their authority. And then they exercised their authority because of how they were taught. That's important. Okay, so my kid's 16. It could have been a 16-year-old that was up there. But yet I'm going to be worried about him driving? That's dumb. I'm going to be worried about all the... No, and let me tell you what, I'm not. And here's why, because he has been raised in the ways of the Lord and he knows who he is. And so when he goes through in that car, like up to North Hills, like he's driving himself right now, I don't have to be checking my phone on a, my Life 360 app that I have. I don't have to be like, oh, well, he's going through the tunnel right now. Oh, he's doing this right now. He's doing that right now. No, because guess what? I know that he knows who he is, and I have prayed over him and the hedge of protection that's over him, and he's going to arrive at his destination. <laughs> and all those other crazy drivers that are on the road, they should be thankful that my kid's there. Because guess what? If you were, did a stupid thing and you ran that stop sign, you're going to be saved too. Because it's not coming close to my kid. Why? Because I know who I am, and I know who Jesus is. We're not settling for less in my house. You do what you want, but not here. Not here. And guess what? It's working real well. Real well. God is so good. So, Paul and Silas, highly persecuted. We were talking, we've been talking about Paul for a long time, you know, being grace and all. We talk about him a lot. When they were released from the jail, when the jailer took them out, when their chains were, were taken off of them by the Holy Spirit, they come out of the jail with the jailer, and then they go, and the, the jailer says to them, this is what they talk about, they said, then he called for a light, ran in, fell down trembling, this is the jailer, before Paul and Silas, and he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Why? Because he saw the goodness of God. He didn't run to everybody else. He ran to the people who were freed and then who stayed. Character. And he said, what do I have to do to be saved? So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. Because then they, you know, they went to the house. And he took them to the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and his family were baptized. Now, when he had brought them into his house, he sat before them, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all of his household. Now, you have a free will, and I have a free will, and the people in your family have a free will. And I'm not saying that if you pray that God's going to go against their free will, because he will not do that. However, when they are seeing the goodness of God, how can, and they see the love of God. How is it that they're not going to want what you offer? And what you offer is Jesus. They are going to want what you have to offer. They are going to want what you have because you're different. Because they can see that sometimes the trials come, but you're the same. You can, there could be a lot of stuff going on at home, but you're the same. Your patience is having its perfect work in you. And you don't, you're not like... And looking like everybody else who's down there, who's down in the dumps. No, because we have a sure word that we may be down today, but God is with us 
in the trials, that we are coming out and through the trials. And what's happening today isn't but a thing, it's just time. We have that assurance. And when you have that assurance, it shows. It shows. Do you remember the story of Samson? Strong guy, gave away his secret to his power, right? The last thing that Samson did on this, his last act for God, he was blind, they gouged his eyes out, they cut his hair, he's weak, they're all gathered in this place, and he says, he figures out, these guys need to be destroyed. They are evil. And he figures, huh, if I knock down the columns, then everyone is going to be destroyed. So what did he do? Samson, Samson said to the lad, the kid, who is zero to 20, he said to the kid who held him by the hand, lead me to the pillars which support the temple so I can lean on them. Then what happened after that was he took his hands and he pushed the pillars away, got that last burst of strength, and, the temple, and it came down and killed everybody there, including himself. But look at, the, look, at what, look at who led him there. It's that age group that we're talking about. It's the age group that revivals are happening in even today, like literally today, in college campuses everywhere. It's what's happening even in our church. It's what's happening here. But if we sit by and do not exercise our authority, it's, nothing is going to happen. They're going to go along the wayside with the rest of the world. It is up to us to pray for this generation and to declare what is happening in our families. Here's the good news. Let's say you're like, oh, I didn't have any kids. I don't have any brothers and sisters. I am alone in my life. I have nobody at all. Well, here's good news for you today. You can be part of that generation. Here's why. Because we have a scripture on it. The scripture on it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, forget not all of his benefits, who forgives all of my iniquities, who heals all of our diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. mercies. So even if I stopped right there, you're in a good place. You're in a good place. Because that's what the Lord can do for you. He satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. And that is not, eagles, when they, they will molt and get rid of their, their pluck out their feathers and then grow brand new ones. That's why the eagle is a beautiful picture of our youth being renewed because they will, they will pluck themselves bald and then grow completely new and fresh. And that's available to you. So you can be in the generation you, can't, you don't have to be sad that you're not 20 years old. You can be in the generation that affects a change, no matter what your age is, because you can have those new feathers. It says in the Bible, blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, that means it has reverence for the Lord, who walks in his ways. When you eat the labor of your hands, you shall be happy, and it shall be well with you. Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine in the very heart of your house. Your children like olive plants all around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord, who reverences the Lord. Your children will be like olive plants. So that is a picture of the anointing. Because that's where the anointing oil comes from. Olive plants, olives that are crushed. That is a symbol of the anointing that is on them. That is a beautiful picture. And sometimes we just like read through it really quick because we want to get our chapter a day in. Slow down sometimes and look and think about what these things actually mean. A picture of God's anointing sitting around your table. That man is blessed. His family is blessed. And they're sitting right there all together as a group, as a unit. Do you remember the story of Joseph? Joseph. When he, now, Joseph is an example of the closest representation of what Jesus is to us, okay? Joseph went, and he was sold into slavery. Then he went from there, and he ends up in Potiphar's house, divine favor on him, and he is called out. 
And the Bible says that when Joseph found favor in Potiphar's sight and served him, when he made him overseer of his house, and all that he had, and all that he had, he put under his authority. When he put that under his authority, so he has the authority, he gives some stuff to Joseph, then what happens? Just like we have authority, we turn over what we have to Jesus, and what happens? And so it was that from that time that he made him overseer of his house, and all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. He will bless Kim's house for Jesus' sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. On all that you have. That's your kids, that's your dogs, that's your cats, that's your car, that's your food. That is your sphere of influence that you have, that's your friendships. All that you give to him will flourish because you give it to him. Because you have the authority, you give it to Jesus, and then that blessing is commanded over all of your things. It's so funny that I'm talking about authority, but I'm also talking about the fact that you have the authority, but what you do with your authority is that you give it back to him, and then you walk in what he already gave you. So it's a picture of walking side by side with the Lord. You can't do it alone, but he's not coming back to die on the cross either. You have to walk in what he already gave to you, and he's with you the whole way to support you and to love you. And even when you're through the valley of the shadow of death, you don't have to fear because you know that you're walking through with the creator of the universe that knows what you need and knows that you will get through it. In Nope. In James, it says, Submit yourself, therefore, to the Lord. Resist the devil, and he will flee. I'm giving you two last scriptures. Two. When you resist the level, the level, the, whatever level you're on, when you resist the devil, he will flee. You have scripture. James 4, 7. It's even easy to remember. In 1 Peter 5, 8 through 9, it says, Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring liar. It is a roaring liar, but it is a roaring lion. Seeking, looking for someone to devour, stand firm against him. Be strong in your faith. Don't cower. Remember that, you're, that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering that you are. Think about that. We all go through stuff. We all have the kid that went astray for a while. We all have these things that happen, to, like that happen in the world around us. But it's how we respond to it that's the difference. If we sit there in our authority with our mouths closed, nothing's going to happen. You have to open your mouth. You have to show his goodness and his mercy to those that are around you, to your children, to the, your family, to the people that you hang around. You show them what the goodness of God is. And I want to leave you with this, and it is something that we talk about a lot in here, but it's the way that I'm about to say it is revelation, and here's why. Did you know there is a devil? Absolutely. Did you know that he can see what you're doing, but he cannot hear what's in your head? He can't. He cannot hear what's in your head. So what's going on in there, if you say it or you act on it, that's when he knows he's got you. Step one, keep your mouth shut about that. What's the craziness that's happening in your head? Do not give it feet. When you give it feet, it will run rampant in your life. He listens for what you are going to allow him to do. Try it. See if it works, because it does. It works every single time. The authority that you have is nothing. If you are like the traffic cop standing in the middle of the intersection and you do nothing, and you just stand there with your arms down, stand there with your, with your mouth closed, you're gonna get hit and run over in your authority. 
Why? Because you never said, not today. I stand against, based on the word of God, I stand against what is coming at me. Devil, you must flee. We are not standing for this any longer. Not in my house. My children are blessed. They are called of the Lord. They have favor on their lives with friends and family and teachers. They are quick learners. They are quick thinkers. They are protected and loved by my heavenly Father who loves them even more than I. So they can go out into the world and not even have to even think about it. Why? Because of what you said. Or, or do this. Stand and talk doubt and unbelief. Now you've heard it. The devil's heard it, and he has the open door to do whatever he wants. You're standing. You have so much power, and you're the one who's standing in the gap for those that are not saved or that are saved and don't know any better, and they're just accepting stuff in their lives. Or You are standing there, and we're standing silent. Not anymore. We are no longer standing silent because we know better. In my generation, even in my generation, not like it was so long ago, but they, we were taught to be a little quieter. We were taught, not in my house, but we were taught to be a little calmer. Let the guys lead. Let the guys do what they do. And then stand back, and if there happens to be an opportunity, and the sun shines right the, that day, then you can have your time. No. When you are in a family environment, the husband has had the house. I do not disagree with that. That is the Bible. But you have authority in your home. You have authority on your street. You have authority in the city. And you have authority in this country. And both women and men need to stop being just, oh, I'm just being humble. I'm just being quiet. I'm just waiting for the Lord. No, open your mouth for what you read in his word. Because that's when things start to happen. That's when you see these moves of God that are real. I'm not saying, I was not implying at all that any of the moves that we've seen right now are not real. That's not what I'm implying. But I'm saying that kids, especially that younger generation, they can spot a phony in a hot second. We're not manufacturing anything here. We're walking in the authority that God gave us to do what he called us to do. And everyone's going to be drawn for that, for his glory and for his good. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for what you've given us today. We thank you, Lord, for what you gave us when your son was, died for our sins and he got the authority and then handed it to us. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us that is big, that can give us the words to say at the exact moment that we need to say them and to the exact people that we need to. We thank you, Lord, that after today, we, our eyes are open to who we are even more so in you and that we don't have to accept just status quo. We don't have to accept the darkness that's happening in the world. We have to accept that you are with us in times of trial and that those trials are going to be over and we are going to come through on the other side. And we thank you for it and give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.